Welcome to Club Parallel, everybody. How are we doing this afternoon? There we go. Yeah. It is great to be here this afternoon. We are streaming live from Pasadena, California. I am here, Jesse Mogul. I am your host. I have an amazing panel. We're going to get right to them. If you're watching us live streaming, then obviously you found us at ParallelMusic.com. Get on social media. Hashtag us at, at uh, Parallel Music. Hashtag Parallel Music. Find us at ParallelMusic.com. Send that link out to your friends. Get more people watching right now. Panelists, it's great to have you here today. Welcome. Thank How you, are we all you, doing? Thank you. Doing good. I'm going to give everybody an opportunity to introduce themselves, starting here with you, Young Nova. Jump right on in. Like you just said, I'm Young Nova, rapper out of Los Angeles, California, under Last Battalion Music. Out here just trying to enjoy the experience and have fun with the audience. Excellent. My name is uh, Brian Salas. Uh, everyone out here calls me Salas. Um, have a company called Magnet Music CEO, uh, full record company, uh, management, producing, consulting, uh, started in 2007. Looking forward to having a great uh, afternoon with you guys. Thank you. My name is Brandy Dobbins, wow. and I am a manager for an awesome group in the Inland Empire called Wild Boy Fresh. Work for our company. We start our own record label company called Fresh Nation, and we're just out here for the experience and join us all. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for joining us, Brandy. What's up? I'm DJ Lico, producer and manager on the Last Battalion Music and CEO as well, and I just want to have a good time with y'all today. Yeah. All right. My name is Leon Claiborne, a.k.a. Lee Clay Bang. I'm a MC. DJ, dancer, and event coordinator. Just here to have a fruitful conversation and make some more connections. Excellent. All right, let's give it up for our panelists, everybody. Excellent. All right, now listening to your bios, it's very clear that in this industry, you can't just be one thing. You can't just be a producer. You can't just direct. You can't just be a, an artist. Let's start down there with Brandy D. What's it like trying to be able to manage all of these different talents as one person and really finding the time to do them all really well? Yes, it does take a lot of commitment and time. We have um, 13 band members in our group, and <laughs> all 13 of them have jobs and families and schedules. So it's very hard to you know, work with that around scheduling. So it does take a lot of time and a lot of commitment. I bet. It sounds like it's going to be really tough. Let's go down there to, uh, well, I guess, no, hold on. Is that Lee Clay Bang? Let's talk to you about this real fast. You sound like you had a lot of different talents. What's it like for you to be able to juggle all of those at the same time? Well, it's like an evolution just growing up. I mean, being a student of hip-hop culture, it, it was normal for people to be dancers, taggers, MCs, and DJs all at the same time. It was just how we expressed our elements. So it was just something I've continued to carry on as an adult. Obviously, I have more responsibilities as a father, so there's only certain things I can focus on. So. <laughs> it sounds like that would be hard enough to juggle with just being a father, let alone trying to do everything else in this industry. Um, DJ Lico, jump in on this. As somebody who is a DJ but also does other things, how are you managing your time and, it's, you know, and being able to get your audience to interact with you, whether it be social media or just at the events that you're actually at and working on? Yeah, um, the good thing about me is I'm like a full-time uh, music person, so I get to ha like have some time at nighttime to do all like the social media stuff. During the day, I'll be like networking with people, meetings and stuff like that. And then um, at like late night, you know, as everybody knows, studio night starts like at midnight all the way to the morning. And that's when we really record music with like Young Noah, which he's one of my artists. And um, and yeah, so you know, I just try to manage all my time as, as much as I can. I'm single, I don't have kids, so that benefits me a lot. Yeah, you bring up a good point, because I really feel like for a lot of artists, for a lot of us up-and-comers, it's tough to be able to make money with what our passion is, and at the same time still trying to put bread on the table. Yeah. Young Nova, what do you find is one of the most challenging aspects of that, being that you're an up-and-coming rapper, but at the same time, you still have to eat. Well, um, what I have to say on that is I actually just had a kid. He's 10 months, so I'm really having to grind it out and put um, food <laughs> yeah. on the table. But mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's tough, especially in a game that's oversaturated. You're trying to find a, a variety of different sounds, something to break through in the industry. So it's really tough. I, w I, I would think so. Um, Brian Salas, jump mm -hmm. in on this. Still looking at everybody's, still learning everyone's names, mm -hmm. so ignore me whenever I look down. But Brian, you have, a, again, a lot of different things, a lot of different titles. Mm -hmm. How are you managing to juggle everything? Um, one is this tremendous commitment to uh, success, actually. So, you know, I'm all in as far as how important this is to me. I'm also a full-time single father of two children, and I have the benefit of having a great support system that helps me with that. But you know, it's a 24 seven business. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm always, you know, working right now is the, the one time I've ever turned my phone off, you know, um, yeah. so for my clients or for the next <laughs> however long we're here, they can't even get a hold of me. But basically what I do is, you know, um, every day I consider myself working, you know, I, it's, I, on some level. So, you know, whether I'm, you know, pr helping produce a track and honoring a, a project for another artist, 
uh, managing my, you know, the three artists that under my uh, company, um, consulting for people. Um, sometimes you also have to just be social. You have to right. go out to events and yeah. and you know and and network and 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 hang out at video shoots and you know do all these things. So once you commit yourself to if this is what you really want to do and you basically put all your chips in, you know, there's really no excuse. You just you know you just have to just get up and just go and get out right. of the house. You know yeah. what I'm saying? That's my my goal every day is I got to get out of the house and put you know tremendous physical energy into success. That's some good stuff right there, guys. Where's the cheering for that? <laughs> so let me make it. Let, let me just be clear. So three out of our five panelists have children at home and they're trying to make it in this business. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of that's a lot to juggle. I can mm -hmm. barely feed myself some days. But you all brought up something that I was thinking about. There's always that issue with burnout in this industry because, like you just said, Brian. There's really no off switch. There's no off time. I mean, every time you leave the house, you're meeting people, you're networking. Even when you think you're not networking, you're networking because you never know if somebody you meet is somebody important 100%. or somebody that'll go, you know, destroy your reputation because you didn't do something right in front of them. Exactly. So let's start here. We'll move our way down. How do you how do you fight off that fatigue? How do you make sure that you don't burn out because you you're constantly trying to be on, but you still have to have like young Nova time. Well, a uh, very good way I fight off the fatigue, which I found that a lot of successful people actually do before I did it, is um, daily tasks, daily um, yearly goals, monthly goals. I find time to create a list of things to do and make sure I get it done, whether it be okay. from working out and, um, of course, writing songs, promoting my music, going out, like he said, and um, networking with people and making sure you do the groundwork. That's one of the main things is just making sure I get tasks done. Right, so you have a, a small to-do list, things that actually can be done in one day rather yeah. than, oh, I'm gonna be famous. Well, that's a five-year plan. Brian, yeah, what do you have to say? What, do you, what are you doing to battle that fatigue, especially because you have kids at home? I had to change my um, approach to you know to life. When you when you know when you have a nine to five you know life, you know you go to bed at you know ten or eleven, you wake up at six or seven, go to work, and you know you have the same kind of routine. My goal now is I look at sleep as how much sleep do I get in a in a week's basis, right? <laughs> and some days I'll get eight hours sleep, some days I'll get two hours sleep. I'll take naps. I'll do whatever I got to do to recharge my battery. So that's one thing I do is just for just on a physical, you right, know, just make sure right. I get enough actual physical rest. The other thing is is you know, um, always making sure that I'm making some contribution to myself um, regarding you know what I'm what I'm working on, and that fuels me because I live my life based on pure passion. I am actually very passionate about this particular business. I I like the business. The, the thing every artist hates, I actually love. You know, the okay. business, the the, the nitty gritty of you know negotiation contracts, the contracts, and, the all that stuff. The eyes across yeah, the I love that as well as I like being in the studio. So. I'm fully much rewarded in, in that way, and you know I get a lot of uh, my, my social fulfillment too. Okay. In that way too, so I'm not looking for um, you know vacations or getaways or whatnot, because I actually l literally love what I do, and so that fulfills me enough to keep going every day. Okay. Yeah, I heard, once heard a saying: if you need a life, if you need a vacation, then stop having a life you need to escape from. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, Brandy D, yeah. you mentioned 13 artists already—a yes. tough amount to juggle. Yeah. So you're trying to manage all of them, and they're trying to manage their own time how are you keeping yourself and the band from burning out man number one god okay <laughs> yeah, there you go there you go <laughs> but we have a, we set goals like same thing that we do we set short-term goals and we also set long-term goals for myself personally once i set a goal i don't look back you have to stay constantly moving in motion once you stop you never know what could happen. So we're consistently moving forward. We're consistently um, striving for better and better and better. So one thing that I do is we set goals and we try to make those goals. And I can't look at my job. I can't look at how much money's coming in. When you start looking at different things, you get off focus. Right. So you just look at the goal and I just allow it to flow. How do you keep 13 people on point? to make sure that they're keeping up with their little task and they're, and they're doing what you ask. Cause that's, you know what? How do you do that? <laughs> like they say, it takes a, a village to raise a child. It takes a team with the band okay. and all of us are all together. We encourage each other, we support each other. It's like a family unit. So when one person may be slacking, there's one other person helping them up. Okay. So nobody falls and no one is left behind. So it's a team effort. There you go, mm -hmm. there you go. <laughs> is this some of the team over there by yes. chance? <laughs> I'm getting the feeling that this is some of the support network right over here. right there and a little bit over there. <laughs> yes. DJ Lico, same question to you. What are you doing to battle that fatigue, keep yourself fresh and ready to go every day? Um, I like eating a lot. Eating a lot? Yeah. <laughs> so I go to a lot of restaurants with my friends and uh, movies. Uh, at nighttime, I try to set time from like 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. And then I just go to the gym and just enjoy myself. Put my headphones on and 
ignore the world. Getting lost in some physical activity seems like yeah. it's a good idea. For, mm -hmm. I, I do that myself yeah. personally. I'm a rabid fan of the gym just because it's the only place I can, people, yeah, don't true. take the phone, put on music, and do not talk to me while I'm yeah. there. It's like sometimes, it, like if I'm sick, I'll still go to the gym because I feel like I'm not sick once I'm at the gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a very good point. And since I eat a lot, it balances out, gym. <laughs> <laughs> it's like eat a pizza, do some push-ups. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Lee Claybang, what's up, what up with you? How are you doing this? Um, you know, it's interesting because it's all about balance. I mean, you, I mean, you could burn yourself out, you could grind, 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 but it's all about balance. I mean, with me having a wife and kids, I have to, I have to give everybody love, you know what I mean? And, I'm, and I wanna be a husband, a good husband, not just a great artist, you know what I mean? So I think a lot of things, you, you, could, you could lack some things if you go too hard on your, on your passion right. and not your family, because they're, they're gonna be the ones who benefit from your grind. So just making those date nights with the wife, making the, the children time, I mean, they're, they're my motivation. When they wake okay. up in the morning and I see them, I'm like, okay, it's time to grind. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. the fruits of my labor are gonna benefit off of that. Mm -hmm. So it's like he said, doing the task list. I mean, even just making the minimum task, like, all right, I'm gonna reach out to three promoters today. I'm gonna make a new mix CD by the end of Friday. Friday, 12 p.m., cut off, that's it. So it's like, you're pushing yourself, but it's not uh -huh. unrealistic. And then um, just having a good support system. I, I have a lot of friends that are married, so we like lift each other up. You know, you see those <laughs> times, the guy time, the girl time. So. Just trying to figure out that balance and then really invest in the time in each element of expression that I have. So with the father, being a husband, DJ, dancing, and right. researching in the culture as well. So. Okay. Now our topic, right? Yeah, you guys can give it up. All right. There's some, right, right. So our, our topic there was managing. I, I want to move over into the touring aspect because there's a lot that goes into being able to get your act on the road, whether it be here in Los Angeles or around the places. Maybe let's, just, let's start off with some of the toughest aspects of touring as far as maybe a challenge that you now know that you didn't know that first day. You said, hey, I'm going to jump in a van and go and uh, perform in Santa Barbara. <laughs> so let's start with you, Young Nova, because you're on my left. What do you think is one of the biggest challenges of touring? The biggest challenge of touring to me is just finding your fan base, finding the, um, the crowd that's going to move with you. Um, that's that's the, the, whole, the whole idea of touring is finding the crowd that's going to okay. buy into what you do, buy into your brand and buy into your music. So for me, that's, that's the biggest thing is Finding, finding your crowd. Okay. Most yeah, that definitely. makes sense. That makes sense. Brian, what are, what's your take on this? Ooh, uh, the thing about, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're based in, obviously, in the L.A. area, and I find that the, the, one of the biggest things for artists based in L.A. is when you're trying to, you know, put on, you're just starting locally, right, when you're trying to put on shows and, and whatnot, because <laughs> everyone in L.A., feels like they're in the entertainment business. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Nobody wants to buy a ticket, <laughs> right. right? So this is not a consumer market, even though it's the second yeah. biggest market in the country. It's just really not a consumer right. market. So, you know, trying to get, you know, 100 people, 200 people, 300 people, 1,000 people to buy a ticket, everybody wants to be comped. Everybody wants to be on the guest list. Yo, you know, how, you know, how many can I get on my lip? <laughs> and so when you're trying to start off here, you know, you, you're, you have to get fans here. So but the, my suggestion to up-and-coming artists is, although you may be based here, look in other what I call consumer aspects of, of, of the city, consumer markets of the city, and, and try to do shows there. So you have like Orange County, you have San Diego, you have the IE, you have uh, the Palm Springs area, you've got you know the Santa Barbara, you know, drivable areas where people aren't in the industry right. or they don't see themselves in the industry and they can be real fans, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So going back to what my man right here said is getting those fan base, but try to penetrate non-LA actual consumer markets to get those fans. Right. And then, get them to buy a ticket and then they'll keep coming back and then and then after you, you do that you know a few times and you've got you know you've got uh, a, a little circuit of, of events or promoters that you work with that you know hopefully very good promoters because aren't that many great promoters then <laughs> people will be like oh you're a profitable act well everybody wants to work with anyone who makes money right anybody yeah so then it's like oh so you you sell out you know such and such club in Orange County oh you know what another you know promoter another um, booking agent whatever the the they'll start to get you know wind of what you're doing and then they'll just they'll start to come to you right you know like you know like the the movie Field of Dreams if you build it they will come mm -hmm. so once you build it they will then you know come but you can't start like in the heart of Hollywood mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is the the most difficult thing to do yeah. because like i said no one wants to buy tickets so right. that's you know that's how you know my my suggestion to anyone who's like really kind of starting is try to work around the the Hollywood, I mean, you have to do shows in Hollywood, but don't expect to get paid in Hollywood. Yeah. 
do the shows, get yeah, the you buzz. Make, you make a really good point there, Brian, because I feel like I've seen a lot of acts, they, they try to build a fan base in Hollywood, they make zero money, they go off, they do really well outside of the city, and then all of a sudden pe people in LA are like, oh, oh if yeah. other people will pay for your work, now I'll pay for your work. Exactly. I'm like, well, why weren't you paying for the work to begin everyone's with? Too cool to, everyone's too cool for school. Yeah, it's you know, all about too cool for school. Everyone's too cool for school. Everybody, everybody is a something. You know, yeah. they're the model, they, you know, video director, publicist. You're like, no, you're just on Instagram. It's really yeah. all you are. <laughs> but, you know. And you only have 500 followers because you make kissy faces all exactly. the time. Exactly. Right. Uh, Brandy, jump, jump into this yes. because I, I hate to go back to that 13 band member right, saying, but, but, it, but it's such a huge aspect of what you do right. and to tour with that many people and the, the logistics of their jobs, the burnout. How do you get all of them in the same place at the same time? Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we have been so blessed, though. I mean, if you were not a fan of Rock Boy Fresh, it's such a blessing because when they come on stage, there's fans like right afterwards, like they draw people in. And so wherever we go, we're really blessed because, you know, they bring fans on. But we've had the opportunity to tour in, um, in New York, um, New Jersey, um, Florida, and we're about to do some international touring, um, Japan, and also um, I think maybe Brazil, we're trying to figure it out. But the main thing that we come up against, like you said, is mainly is finances, is really, really big. You mm -hmm. know, like people out here, they say they support us, but when we come to the asking for that support, yeah. it's nowhere to be found. So definitely we come, <laughs> out of, we come out of pockets a lot to support you know, our vision and our goals. So definitely finances and taking off times. Everybody works. I either work Monday, somebody's working Tuesday. So taking off you know, two weeks of work and not getting any mm -hmm. pay to support your vision, support your goal, it's really commendable that they do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult, you know, and I see where this conversation is going, so I'm gonna organically let it go there. Mm -hmm. I've had a long-standing idea that the reason so many people think things should be free is because the internet's so free. Mm -hmm. And because you can go on there and so many, whether it be USA Today articles or back in the day when it was Napster, so much was available for free, people got it in their head that things should just be free. Right. And uh, there's a Facebook page I follow called mm -hmm. Stop Working for Free, and it's, it's, got, it's got musicians like you guys, it's got artists like me, it's got photographers, we're all out there hustling. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants our work for free. Right. Um, DJ Liko, this is where I want you to jump in. Where do you find it the most annoying in your professional life when people don't want to pay for a talent you've been procuring throughout your entire life? And you're yeah. like, it took yeah. me 10 years to get here. You should at least give me $10. Right. Yeah. Um, I think there's like three points on that. And the first one would be, like they said, you know, like trying to get the right crowd. Um, that usually affects because like you, you feel like you put so much work at home or in the studio and then you want to put it out, but like there's so many people doing the same thing. You know, like you go to your neighbor's house, he's probably a rapper too, or a DJ or a producer, something like that. So um, yeah, that's one of the main things, like, you know, just trying to get the, the, the project across people's ears and, and having them support you. Uh, the other thing, like she said, you know, the, the budget, like, mm -hmm. like we're about to do um, a trip to uh, Columbia at the end of um, August. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be touring over there for about uh, two weeks. Uh, we have a single that we're gonna drop over there. So we're kind of like starting from outside in to the US. Okay. And that's the main reason why, because like it's so saturated here and everybody's doing the same thing. You know, anything that has to do with artistry, yeah. you know, DJs, MCs, anything, like you have it. it. It's already here. So why would you even like try to compete against them since there's, you know, like all the people that don't wanna support. So we wanna get out of here and we're gonna start from like South America. Okay. And try to bring it all the way back. So, um, so you take a different marketing approach in as much as that you want to go as far away as you can yeah. and really just drag the fandom back in, going exactly. international first, which is even more intense than just say, yeah. let's try and to go to them, Brooklyn. it's like we are international because we're coming from out yeah. there. Mm -hmm. and, and one of my other artists, his name is uh, Richie Alexander. He's from Colombia. Okay. And he's a Spanish and English singer. So we kind of have like this little campaign going on. Like he's making his way back to his hometown because he was born over there but raised in Long Beach. Okay. So uh, Young Noah, he's going to be coming out with us too. He's featured in some of the songs. So um, you know we have this project that's like really like like orchestrated right, but we still don't know how people are going to take it right. over there in Colombia. It's know? always a given flow yeah, of it's the a fandom, risk. and will, yeah. it, will it hit that market? Yeah, exactly. So um, from what we've heard, it's like a really good market in South America. So if we can like make some type of noise out there and then take it to like Europe. And then bring it back to the U.S. and that's fine with me. Well, yeah, you knock out Central or even and if South don't America have to, and so Europe. You, I think you've done yeah, a pretty. Even good if we job. don't have to ever come back to the U.S., like, right. I'm fine with that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Maybe they'll pay for stuff over there. Yeah, exactly. Like I'll just have, I'll just live here, but not work here. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm cool with that. I, I want to come back and just relax here. And that's, that's awesome. What I got to do. And then the last point will be um, sleep. Sleep. Yeah, like touring <laughs> and sleep don't go together. So, um, you know, like it was, it was a few 
years back when um, I was I was going to uh, San Diego with Dre Sinatra, and um, and I was driving actually, and I was just falling asleep every time, falling asleep, and he kept waking me up like, "Come on, man, you're gonna make us crash. Come on, wake <laughs> up, wake up." So then um, I tried my best to stay awake, and I couldn't. And he's like, "Pull over." And then we went to this gas station. He got me two Red Bulls, and he's like, "Drink this." So I, I took them, and then he's like, "Let me ask you something." I'm like, "What's up?" And he's like, "Are you a regular season player or are you a playoff player?" And I was like, "I'm a playoff player." So I start acting like one. And then I was like, "I was like, player, I player." <laughs> so that means player players don't fall asleep behind the wheel. Yeah. <laughs> and I told him, I, I, and I told him, I was like, "Dre, I haven't slept in three days. I've been in the studio all day." And then we went straight from, I mean, three days in the studio. And then Friday, we went straight to San Diego. I DJ from 11 to 12.30. He DJ from 12.30 to 2. At 2, we had to drive back because we had another show and, uh, for after hours in LA at 4 in the morning. So it was from 4 to 6 a.m. And, and I was like, I haven't slept. And he's like, three days? I'm like, yeah. He's like, that's cute. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you bring up a good point. Let's, let's hit on that. I, I, I think a lot of people can be accomplished outside of Los Angeles, but when you come here, no one cares anymore. And out there, I found that even though you, you accomplished a lot, like people have like normal yeah. schedules here, you think, oh, I haven't slept in three days. You can't whine to anybody mm, exactly. because no one slept in three days. Mm -hmm. uh, Lee Clay, blank, jump in on this because with the kids, with everything else going on in your life, like you can't complain to no one else either, can you, about sleep? Well, I think with me is that you just have to kind of define like what success means to you. Like, what does that mean? So like for me, if I'm getting booked like two times a month, three times a month, whatever, I'm, I'm satisfied with that because at the end of the day, people don't have to pay for anybody's services, right. especially as a DJ. Like you could go to Spotify, throw a list on and be cool all night. So I come from a place of just being, being passionate and being able to be a service to people and just provide quality. I'm all about quality and being humble because if, you, if you're trying to come up, and you're like stepping on people, you know, you come with this ego, then whether you're making it or not, it's gonna backfire. And there's yeah. this thing called karma that's, that really does exist, you know? Um, but with sleep with me, I mean, I get it when I can, you know, especially when the babies are new, you don't sleep. It's <laughs> zombie apocalypse, you know what I mean? But Do you get to tour because of the kids? Because I want to, before we move over to the contract part of this conversation, he, DJ Lico, had mentioned that this market's so saturated. You have like six different talents. Any fool out there with a laptop and a microphone all of a th sudden thinks they're a musician or a DJ. If they have shoes, they think they're a dancer. Right. How do you stand <laughs> out? How do you feel when you see people, oh, I'm a dancer, and then you watch them dance, and it's like you're doing, I don't know, whatever a dance move is called. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, um, they're over there doing the sprinkler, and you're like, seriously, dude? <laughs> well, you know what? I, I, my whole thing is like, again, it comes back to being humble because just growing up, everybody did a lot of different things. But it was, there was no internet to really like copy stuff. You kind of just, you grew up in this neighborhood and you, you were a b-boy, you were a rapper, you were a graffiti. That was regular. So now, since you're so saturated, how I, I, I tend to stand out is literally just channeling the, the reason why hip hop even exists is to like provide and, and to like learn and you know teach right. each one, teach one. Like now, nobody wants to collaborate with you unless you have a name. Nobody, everybody just talk about money or whatever the case may be, but when we, able to collaborate and produce like fruitful work that's affecting people's lives in a positive manner, then it's a win-win. Right. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. when you don't see that, it's kind of no point in doing what you're doing. All right, good answer, good answer. All right, everybody, we are currently live streaming here at Club Parallel in Pasadena, California. How you guys doing? Are we enjoying this so far? Yeah. <laughs> We're having a great time. Just to, just to reintroduce all of our guests for those of you out there live streaming, we got Young Nova, Brian Salas, Brandy D, DJ Lico, and Lee Clay Bang, all right? We are going to jump into the contract portion of this conversation because we've been discussing not getting paid. We've been discussing mm -hmm. going on the tour. Brandy D, I'm going to have you get on this first. Mm -hmm. When it, The hardest part, I feel like, in this industry is bringing up the contract. Everyone knows you're talented, but it, even getting the promoters of the club to fork over the coin, it's like we have talent. How do you... How do you get into that conversation with money without, without sort of going into it with a coward mentality? Like, please, please, sir, just give me two bits today. How do you go into it basically demanding what you know your band is worth? Right. You got to know your worth and you got to know your value. Because if Hell nobody yeah. else does, then if you don't, then they're not going to either. Mm -hmm. So we set a high standard for ourselves because of our worth and our value and what we bring. And that's just what it is. We set it. 
So when we're dealing with contracts, sometimes it is hard because even just we don't really look, look at the money. It's not we're not always focused on money, but you know we we do perform and it's a service. So sometimes like somebody will say, I want to pay you ten dollars, and you have to understand there's thirteen people. You want us to drive to Vegas in our <laughs> own cars. You want us to. <laughs> perform for one hour, you want us to bring our own instruments, and then you want to pay us $10. It's just, just not even gas, you know, it's not feasible for right. them to do that. So it's, sometimes it is challenging, but like I said, you know your worth, you know your value, you set standards for yourself and go, you know, and other people will too, and they'll invest in that as well. Okay. Well, you know, I want to go back before we leave you on this topic, because yeah. you have 13 band members. Right. Is there ever arguments within the band, like I play for 80% of the show, you have a saxophone, you play for five minutes. Is there ever that kind of argument where people are like, <laughs> I deserve more money than you I've been working at this longer than you, you <laughs> is this what? something that I shouldn't be trying to ask right now with all your people right here I'm very interested in this answer. they're like come on Brandy D what's the answer let to that me, let me tell you honestly no when we sat down before when we started discussing who was going to be payments because we have writers we have people who write all the music they produce all the music they compose all the music from scratch and they do everything and they okay. take the time to learn and teach it everyone is paid the same that's where we're at right now. And that's just what it is. No one complains. I wrote the songs. I came up with all the composing of it. I'm singing the most. I played this. No. Everyone has an open heart support and encouragement. So okay. everyone's together on it at this time. A very yeah. Edward Sharp and Magnetic yeah. Zeros kind of mentality on that. That's good. That's good. Yeah, um, it is. DJ Lico, let's get you in on this because you already mentioned you work with Young Nova. You yeah. have a couple other um, artists within your stable. Correct. How are, how do you deal with contracts? Because you're a manager, so you're getting a cut from what they do. But at the same time, you're also an artist trying to get your own yeah. coin out there. Well, we're basically going off the um, the whole ASCAP um, situation. Okay. Yeah, so um, we try to have everything like as straight as possible, no questions, you know, will be asked later because we handle everything at the beginning. And um, aside from that, you know, we have a bigger friendship than than a contract too. So we're kind of like, you know, like we, we can agree on everything we talk about and we're always on the same page. And um, so, I mean, I, I'm not going to talk about the type of percentages we have. Right, that's fine. But, yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I'm not looking for. <laughs> like, yeah, but, the um, money. <laughs> I know, right? But, um, but we're happy where we're at right now. And then, um, you know, when it comes to investments and stuff like that, like, usually it's going to be me and, um, and, and, uh, and my partner that we, we, that we do that. But um, at the end of the day, you know, we just want to make sure everybody's happy with the pay. And, okay. And, uh, like I said, a friendship's more important than the money, so right. we want to make sure we all stay Only the more page. people in Hollywood had that mentality. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's just us or, you know, yeah. if everybody, I'm pretty sure all you guys, yeah. you know, have that type of mentality as well because, um, I mean, we come from having nothing, so if, if we really, you know, focus on money only, then I don't think that's the, the, the main thing, you know. We just, we just want to have a good time, have fun with what we love to do, and get paid for it as well. Good, good answer, good answer, guys. Yeah. I feel like the people that move out here that try to do it just for the money are the ones that wash out in that first one to three years. It, yeah. I actually enjoy watching that happen to them. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, you think you're going to come out here and be rich and famous in three years? Yeah. Good times. You'll be back no, in Omaha I've, I've before been doing you this know for it. I've been doing this for too long to stop now, and, and it don't matter how long it's going to take. You know, We're just going to keep going until... Whether it's five, ten, twenty years, and we'll, yeah, we'll keep you know, trying. Yeah, Nova, you get in on this because as an artist, you know, when you go to get that payment, when you go to tell people, hey, you know, if I'm going to come out, if I'm going to perform, it's whatever, you know, it's it's blank amount of dollars. Do you feel confident when you ask that? And then at the end, if somebody tries to stiff you, how do you go about making sure that you get your coin out of the whole agreement? Well, um, like Lico said, it's basically like our business is handled beforehand. So with the ASCAP or deals, like no, no real problems there. But as far as me on like doing other other ventures, I pretty much get it from a fan base. So I do my performing and distribute my um, distribute my music. And that way, so I you distribute your music yourself, yeah, so you can just go straight rather than having to worry about there being any middlemen, yeah. like pressing your own CDs, dropping on people. Basically, yeah, basically. Right. So I do it that way, and then I'm building at the same time, building the fan base, and then on the other end, there's ASCAP to where our business is handled. Okay. Now, Lee, you have a lot of talents. Do you charge? I mean, again, not looking for money ideas here, just looking for a basic overall philosophy. With so many talents, you charge different for, let's say, rapping versus dancing versus helping somebody manage or producing. And, and where do you fall on figuring out how that rate applies? Because it's not easy in this industry when everyone's willing to work for free to really understand your worth based on what they also do. Well, I think the first thing is you really have to believe in yourself in your talent, and that's, and that's a hard task when you first start, because you're like, oh, I just want to do shows, I want to do shows. Mm -hmm. It's going to take so many free shows for you to get, to be like, I need to be getting paid, because I'm, <laughs> I'm smashing it. You know, you got to have confidence. Yeah. But uh, with me, literally, 
I sat down. I mean, I come. I like bureaucracy. I like paperwork. I like that stuff. Details, contracts, invoices. So I literally, I'll sit down and I change my rate every year, because as you get better, you should be charging more. Right. So every year, I'll sit down and be like, okay, if I'm going to host hosting fee, this is my hosting fee. Is it a wedding? Is it a birthday party? Is it a corporate event? Is this a, a nonprofit? Then I have prices for that. Wedding, where's the wedding? And how far is it? Over 40 miles. You know, like right. all the details, the needy, the stuff you don't want to think about. Because that, when you go into those meetings, I literally, I sell myself. I go to people, we, we meet, and then by that conversation, they're going to hire me or not. Okay. So when I go there, I got to be as detailed as possible and be confident as possible. Be like, okay, well, you're 60 miles away. That's going to be an extra hundred dollars. You know what I mean? Right. And, and, and speaking with confidence. Yeah. And sometimes if they come under the rate, sometimes you just can't take that job. Right. And it's okay. You bring up a good point. For the emerging artists out there who are watching, for these people who don't understand the whole how you set even how you even begin to set a rate, when you first start, what was it that made you say, okay, if I'm going to go out and I'm going to host an event, it's worth $100 an hour or $50 an hour. Are you just asking people? Are you talking to other people in the industry? Where do you come up with the figure to even start at? Both. I'm, I'm like the super duper researcher. I'll ask all my buddies who's been DJing forever, people who get paid big money to little money. I'm like, oh, when you first started, what did you charge? Okay, when you started getting into it, what was your rate? Or when you do a wedding, what did you charge for this? Or when you host and when you do a nonprofit, so when do you do the free stuff? When, you know, yeah, yeah. I literally ask all these different people who are involved and I kind of calculate my own okay. thing and just be confident in it. Sometimes it may be too high for somebody. And sometimes it may be a little low, and then I might change. Like, oh, well, I meant to say. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know. yeah, that was per half hour. That's why we need to double that up. We're talking time. hours, right? <laughs> yeah. no. But uh, just really, and I ask questions. I ask questions to everybody. You know, I mean, if there's a manager, I'm going to ask a question about manager. Well, how, do my, how much do you get as a manager when you somebody gets a placement versus doing this live show? I like to le learn that stuff. So right. when I get into that situation, I kind of have a little bit of knowledge okay. on where to start from. And you All know, right. you test it out. And then it just sort of goes with the market. Now, Brian, you were saying earlier you like contracts. I got two people up here <laughs> saying they like contracts. I don't <laughs> think that's many people would admit that. When you're trying to set your beginning threshold so you can move up from that, are you like Lee over there? Are you asking around a lot? Or does experience sort of teach you what you need to be offering yourself? Or is it the difficulty of the work that teaches you what your rate is? Um, it's just, you know, it's a case by case uh, basis. So, you know, when you're starting off, you, you have to you have to showcase your talent you know what I'm saying you know so you're gonna do you know a bunch of free stuff whether you're, if you're a producer you're gonna give out free beats you know what I'm saying if you're an artist you're gonna give out free music and if you're you know and if you're trying to do shows you're gonna just do shows for free after a while once you feel like okay you know you've done it a while and you have like you know uh, uh, you've got a brand of some kind okay. you know then you have to then have to establish some kind of value to that brand now there's still times where you might charge so you may have an artist that you know let's say charges you know, three hundred dollars to do a show, right? And they're just doing little, little spot dates in various, uh, various locations. But if they have an opportunity to open for, let's say, a Nipsey Hussle or a Don Kennedy, it's like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that for free, right? You know what I'm saying? Because of the yeah. exposure. So there's, there's such a thing as the good look. But you got to be able to identify what is a good look. And a good look is something that by doing this particular. Um, service task or whatever for free, the exposure that this now gives me mm -hmm. brings value to me. So then for, so therefore when I do other things, people are like, oh wait, you did, you know, such and such. So, you know, I have a, I have a producer named, uh, an artist producer named Curtis King, and he's produced for, you know, Absol for like the last two or three, you know, um, albums that Absol's done. And so, you know, he may not worry as much about you know, how much he's getting paid maybe for those particular tracks, but then he turns around and then the up and coming artists who, oh wait, you produce for Ab Soul, I want want to be, then I come in and say, oh okay, it's gonna be X amount of dollars. Okay. Because we did that for the look, we did that for the exposure, we did that for the marketing, you know. That particular song went, you know, to, you know, Fader and Complex and went all over the, you know, the internet, so now everyone knows that he produced that song, so now I can then charge this person okay. this much. So you have to be able to gauge when and where and how much, depending on the, the situation. Make a good point. So it's really case by case. It's, it's, very, really, it's, it's really it's very much case fluid. by case. You know, I mean, even when I'm negotiating, you know, for for a, per, a performance, I take into consideration the actual um, event. Is it a festival? You know, is it just a club date? Is it what is it? And then you know, and I can I'm smart enough. I can I know enough about the business. I know everyone in the business. I can pretty much gauge what someone's budget is going to be. So even if they're trying to like you know finagle me, it's like. Eh, but you got this person, this person. All right, I'm going to charge you this. Okay. Just because I can look at the rest of your lineup and know that you're having to come out of pocket to some degree. Or look at your lineup and say, yeah, yeah, it's pretty thin. You don't have much. 
you know, if it's worth it for us to do, we'll do it, you know, a little bit, you know, a little right. less. So it's, it's got to make sense. Yeah. You know, it's got to make sense. And you, you have to be really willing to say no. I mean, I'm, I'm excellent at saying no. Yeah. You know, it's like, no. Nah, <laughs> Which a lot of people good. are at the beginning for a whole year. We've discussed this already, guys. It's like for the first year, you're like, please, just somebody well, let me get on when stage. When you start, you say yes to everything. Yeah. yeah. You say yes to <laughs> everything, anything and everything. And then you get to a point, it's like, and now I'm being selective. It's like, no to that, no to that. And definitely no to you because you're always right. with the shenanigans. I'm not fooling with you. <laughs> you know, and you just kind of just work your way through. And, and, you know, but you have to be confident in saying no. And because I'm a manager, I don't have to ever be an artist. No one ever has to like me. Right. Ever in life do they have to like me because I'm the guy that says no. Or I'm the guy that fights for this or fights for that. So it's very, I'm very comfortable being, you know, uh, the bad guy because it's like, well, you know, I represent this guy. And the artist always has to look good. So I'll be the one to say no. I'll be the one to say, and I, I'm very good at how I say no. I can say no and make you feel good about the fact that I said no. Right, right. <laughs> make, you feel like you, make, make you feel like you won in the fact that I just said no to you. You know, It's, it's how you package things. Brian, it's funny you bring that up. There's a lot of people in, in, in our industry. I find, I, I, br I blame make-believe managers and producers for things all the time. Like, oh, I, I wish I could get to that, but oh, my producer, man, they're on my I bus. Tell my artists, <laughs> I tell my artists all the time, throw, I'm a producer. <laughs> throw me under the bus. If you're having a conversation and I'm not there and you know you don't want to do something, just tell, just tell them I said no. Good, that's a good point. They're not going to ever call me and say, hey, you told such and such. And I'll be like, yeah, I told them that. You yeah, know what I mean? who, who does that? Exactly. Right. So I tell them, throw me under the bus all the time. It doesn't bother me. I'm awesome. You know what I'm saying? I'm very yeah, much comfortable it. in my own skin. So I can be the bad guy 24 7. That's good. There we go. There we go. Now, con contracts exist because of money. And money exists because you've proven worth. And a lot of times you've proven worth because you have a fan base. And in order to get a fan base, you have to get your name out there. And there's so many different ways of marketing yourself nowadays because of social media that, in fact, we almost live in a world full of talented, so, talented white noise is what I call it because anybody can go out there and produce something. So in order to stand out from the crowd, what are some of the things that you've done, Young Nova, to you, – I mean, you can't just be Facebook and Twitter because after a while, Twitter's just screaming into the wind and Facebook's full of a bunch of ads. What are you doing to get your name out there that's unique to your style or to where you're coming from? Well, um, one of the things that I've did or what I what I do to get my name out there is um, I actually do the groundwork. I go out in public and uh, meet people personally because, mm -hmm. like you said, social media is having a lot of people hiding behind the computer. Yeah. And that's actually given the people that are willing to do the groundwork the upper hand and people don't even realize. It's like if you go out and actually do the groundwork, most people aren't doing that anymore. Not anymore, no. They're under the illusion that social media is making everything easier when I feel like it's probably for some people making it harder. Right. Because it it has limits. Social media has limits. You can't be everybody can't be a celebrity over over the internet. Only a select amount of um, select amount of people right. is gonna actually attain success from the internet. So if you actually go out in public and do the groundwork, you're gonna get and by groundwork, you're talking about like trying to push your CDs or maybe you know, those little cards and passing yeah, performances, those out. performances, cards, CDs, everything under the umbrella. If you do everything in person, you get the feedback right away. You get your fan base right away, and you get an upper hand over the people that are on the internet just doing it 24/7. Right. It's good to be on the internet, but have both. Yeah, you can be get on the internet the and be right in person. That's a good point. Lee, bring the, jump in on this because, I mean, he's right. Going out there and doing the footwork, you, somebody can blast out a tweet, but who really reads tweets? What are you doing that's unique that you find has really helped you? Maybe there's one thing in particular you've done. You're like, wow, I never thought that would have worked as well as it did. Well, you know what? I mean, again, going back to being a student of hip-hop, I literally printed out posters about three weeks ago, window-sized posters. <laughs> I went to businesses like, hey, I'm a local DJ in your community. Will you support me, blah, blah, blah. Some of them said no, some said yes. You know, my daughter's preschool, I got a poster up, boom. You know what I mean? So it's like, they're gonna see those parties, they're gonna call me, we're gonna make it happen. But also, like he said, I'm literally knocking on doors. I'll go to restaurants, hey, is the manager here? Can I talk to the manager? And, and present myself, introduce okay. myself, make sure I'm, you know, I look okay, and give them the card, a flyer, keep it pushing. So I think, Always meeting somebody in person is way better than shooting somebody right. an email because email doesn't show who you are. You know what I mean? So yeah. Literally going to establishments and talking to okay. the head honcho. Now, see, that's interesting, guys, because we're only we're only two panelists in. I would have thought somebody's gonna be bringing out social media. Oh, I'm vining all over the place. I'm tweeting. I'm all. I've already heard the first two people say it's all about getting out there, putting your feet to the ground, and actually meeting these people in person, which almost seems counterproductive towards what social media has been pushing everybody to, which is just sit 
sit at home and scream in the wind and hope that somebody listens. Brandy D, where are you guys at on your unique marketing strategy? Because you have so many people, you can practically canvas an entire neighborhood in five minutes. Right. Um, what is something that's unique to your band, to your business that you've used? For us, it's just positioning ourselves to be in the right place at the right time. Okay. So definitely. <laughs> I hear some people, is it, did, you, did she say that a lot? Because you were mirroring her as she was saying it. <laughs> you got, yeah, be in the right place at the right time. So you'll just be somewhere, you'll meet someone, you never know who you're going to be interacting with. That person runs a magazine company who happens to like your personality, what do you do? I right. manage a band, great, can I do an article on you? We've been in so many different magazine articles. We met in so many different people who are working with the Grammys, who are working with the Dove Awards. Like you just never know who you're gonna meet. So definitely make yourself available. Put yourself in places you may not think you would ever meet anybody there. It may be a mm -hmm. restaurant, it may be the mall, it may be a, a, a merch summit meeting that we go to. You just never know. So definitely positioning yourself in you know, getting those connections and one on one. Do you feel like you always have to be representing has you know the idea that like every time you go out there's there's always that chance that oh my god that person who's annoying who's an idiot all of a sudden their great great grandfather did something and like that could have been your deal like one day I'm not gonna put him on blast but one of our band members I met him at the mall and he was just looking a little frumpy and I was like why do you look like that like no you didn't <laughs> well, 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 did you did you really approach some frumpy looking dude and be like it was, he was in our band you can't you're, you're representing yourself uh, oh, oh yeah. he was already in the he band he was already in the band I said you can't, can't be looking like because that's like your representation of yourself. Right. So you just may be somewhere and they're gonna be like, uh-uh, we -uh, got the flip ups on them. Actually, you'd be like, no. So definitely, <laughs> definitely you represent yourself at all times. You just okay. never know. So definitely. Yeah. That, that's a really good point. Yes. Um, Brian, what is what is something that you've done as a uniqueness? Because like you said, you're you're the manager, you're the producer. You don't, no one has to like you, but at the same time, everybody has to like you because you want to you want mm -hmm. people to know that you are somebody worth working with and that you're not just gonna be surly all the time. So what's something that you've done unique in your marketing campaigns to get the voice of your artists out there? Okay, so <laughs> I'm trying to think of how I'm going to answer this question. It might be kind of long, so walk with me here. Um, All right. <laughs> so with my artists, what I do is, one of the things I do is I have to come up with marketing and promotion plans for everybody that I do, uh, and I'm, I'm actually very good at it. But what I do is I, I tailor make everything to that particular artist and what they do. And so what I tell them to do, and I believe in you know what everyone's saying about the physical aspect of physically getting out there is, you know, let's say you, you still make a physical CD, right? Go to, Music's Now is a lifestyle brand. Like, it's this lifestyle. No one actually goes into record stores and buys music. But they will consume music in the midst of something else that they're already doing. So I have a, you know, an artist who was, you know, huge uh, sneakerhead, you know, and he would go, he had relationships with all the best, uh, you know, boutique uh, shoe stores in, in the city. So he had a, he had an album called Dope Kicks Fresh Hats. He literally put his CD in all of the best shoe stores in the in the city. Uh, okay. And so and because he already had a relationship with all those owners, that every time someone like you know there would just be a stack of you know CDs there, and people could just pick one up as they were going and buying their shoes and whatnot. It's like oh you know let me take a look, listen to this and whatnot. He was able to find alternative distribution methods. And so you know you know one place you can go is you know uh, hair salons if you you know if you're a woman or if you're a man, barber shops you know and use those as unique distribution uh, you know systems and methods. So that's one way you know to kind of physically get some music out. Another thing as an artist or myself, what you want to do is people, the average person is a follower. We all know that, right? And so they're influenced by tastemakers or influenced by people that that matter to them, whether it's a noteworthy DJ, a noteworthy blogger, other artists that they listen to, whatever. So if you have an artist, or you are an artist or myself, when you network, when you go out to events, what you want to do is you want to start building relationships with the key tastemakers in, in your area. And by doing that is you don't push your you don't push your music on them. You just build a relationship. Get to know them, shake hands, you know, shake hands, kiss the babies, you know, buy them a drink, hang out. You know, you start going to enough events, people start seeing you. If they see you enough, because of how they see themselves, you must think that you're pretty important because you're at the same events that they're at. And they're important. That's good take. That's so therefore yeah. you must yeah. be important. <laughs> so they're gonna then say, well, what is it that you're doing? You know, I never tell people what I do. They see me at enough, they're like, yo, what is it that you do? And I, I tell them, now they're invested in me. Okay, now once I get them invested in me and just knowing me, then we start chopping it up and whatnot. I then, now, this is how you then bring the internet or the social media back. You know, now that you have this particular relationship and it's an organic relationship, now that when you start to you know put music out because they really support you in general, you put your tweet, your Instagram post, your Facebook you know post, whatever, and they're like, you know what, I like that guy. You know what, I even like that song, and they then retweet it, 
And that's how the social media then helps you because okay. now a noteworthy tastemaker says, yo, I like this song. Or they're just tweeting in general. It's like, oh, man, you know, I, I saw the homie, and he gave me a CD, and, you know, track number eight is crazy. And like, really? So you liked it? And people, no one wants to be, you know, um, you know out of what's popular. Right. So if there's something moving, they want to be, oh, something's moving. I need to be on top of that. So they're going to follow whoever um, the, 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 the trendsetters and the tastemakers are saying you need to listen to. And so, but you get that relationship not on Twitter, not on Instagram, not on Facebook. Facebook, you get that in real life. So you have to go out to these right. events, shake these hands, you know, be with them. Don't press them; just get to know them. Then they see that you know other people that they know. It's like, oh well, you know him, but I don't know you, and I see you all the time. The psychology starts to kick in. Like, yo, I need to know you because you know everyone that I know, but I don't know <laughs> you, and I don't want to feel like I don't, I shouldn't know you. So they have it, to. It know makes you. a valid point. Very. <laughs> All over oh. the place. It's like one of those where's Waldo amazes. You know what? But this, this whole thing is psychology because you have to understand the nature of people and the nature of, of humans. And humans are followers. And so it's like, oh, let me, okay, so let me tag my product on someone that you guys are following. Oh, you like that guy? Tag. Follow him. He'll take you to my, my product. Oh, follow this person. They'll take you to my product. And so that's what you do. And that's why I go to so many, you know, events, so many just places to be. Just, you know, shake hands. You know, I was, I was at an event the other night. And I'm at a point now in my career that I don't even have to work the room anymore. The room works me. Okay. Because everyone now kind of either knows who I am or people that I represent. You know, I have two DJs that are at 92.3, you know, the real now. And so they're like, oh, well, everyone wants their record played. And those DJs are with me. So they got to come. So now everyone's got to come to me. Right. So I can work a room without working a room. I stand in one place and everyone has to come to me. So it takes a long time to get there, doesn't it? It, it, <laughs> it does. That's why I told you I have to, it's about your tremendous commitment to self. Right. And I've been doing this for a long time, but I've laid the found, you know, the, the foundation and the groundwork to be able to do this. So now I can I can now tell someone how to now roll their, their particular product out. I can make a phone call and say, yo, go over to this person, tell them that, you know, I told you to come through, they'll look out for you and whatnot. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. you have to build these relationships. It sounds like one of the foundation principles of your strategy at least, is that you're not just trying to attack people with your product as much as you're just letting them get to know you a little bit better. Oh, I don't sell anything. Right. I'm selling myself the whole time. Awesome. See, the thing is, is people will, will do something for you if they like you. If they like you, they will look out for you. So if you're a likable person, they, will, they just want to like you. If you're an obnoxious person, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to, then you have, to be, you have to be extremely good at what you do to get that listen. But if you're likable, People will listen, and if, if you're not that good, they won't even admit that you're not that good because they like you so much. It's like, you know, he's pretty straight. You know, it's like, nah, <laughs> it's, really not that, it's really not that good. That's good. All right, well, I know we're getting ready to wrap up here. We're going to start with you, DJ Lico. Uh, maybe some closing remarks on what you think the state of the music industry is right now and where you think it could be heading, whether it just be on a personal lever, level or within your whole industry. Yeah. Um, well, let me touch on the last subject just like real quick. Please, yes. And um, I just think one thing people don't really realize is how important it is to, um, no matter what you are, an artist, rapper, singer, no matter what it is, you got to brand yourself. And to do that, you got to have an entrepreneur um, state of mind. So with that being said, you know, like when you got Nike, you got Toyota, you got anything like that, if you have a a specific logo that you're gonna market to people, that's really what people are gonna follow, like, and they're gonna make that connection with you all the time. So, for example, like, when anybody sees my logo, like, it's, they know it's me right away. Okay. So, and, and my logo's been, like, in so many places already, too, like, you know, all the times that I've worked with all the different artists, like, in the flyer, it's my logo. My picture, does, my face doesn't even have to be there no more. They know that's me, and, um, and that's the same thing I did when I when I when I thought of my record label, you know. It, it was, we were in the studio one night, and and I, we went to 7-Eleven to get some chips and stuff. And then I was like, I just want to make a record label. Like we like, cause the, the the first idea was like, let's get signed. And then after that, it was like, no, we don't need to get signed. We need to be the record label, and we need to make this money for ourselves. Okay. And and the reason why, you know, like I started thinking this way too is because you know I've had a, a cool relationship with All Money In now with Nipsey Hussle and them, and it's like. You know that's that's their their state of mind too. You know they're still independent to this moment and and all the money that they've made. You know it's 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 all independent work. Is that where you think the industry is going to go then? In, the, in as much as the big labels are just yeah, going to slowly die. Yeah, there's a lot die. of big record labels distributors already closed down. Right. And it's because of that. And then um, same thing with Mac Miller. You know Mac Miller and I've known him for like four years already. 
and and I've learned a lot from him. You know, just being in the studio with him and all that, and then just conversations where he's just like, I don't want to, I don't want to put all my product all day, uh, you know, to a big company that's going to take such a big percentage. And some of them do 360 deals. Right. So they'll take everything from you. You open up a restaurant, anything with your name on it, they still take the percentage from you, and you get the the, the smaller end. And you know, I've learned so much from just being around this type of people that you know I apply that to my own people, which is Young Nova, Richie Alexander, my other artists. And um, and I make sure that you know that we we take the right path. Now it don't matter how small the move we're gonna make is, we all sit down and talk about it and make sure that's the right thing, so that we don't look dumb at the end of the day, you know, like, right. or like, oh, we're trying to avoid the big guy, you know, like the middleman, but we're not doing the, the right job ourselves. So I don't want that to happen to us. So I want to make sure that, you know, like, especially branding, like it's the main thing. The, the first thing I came up once, you know, once I realized I wanted to make my own record label and I thought of the name, the first thing I went ahead and I talked to the designer, make me a logo. Once right. the logo was done and everything was perfect, then we went to the city, registered the business and everything else. So, you know, just, just want to touch on that branding and entrepreneurship. That's, that's you, the main thing. You make thing. a good point. You even brought up the contract aspect of it again, because here we go back to the money. It's like you, you, you want to start your own label, but you don't really know what you're doing. I guess it's just sort of learning as yeah. you go and hoping you're not leaving, you know, chips on the table when yeah. you walk away. And there's no point of making a contract if you don't have a game plan or, or anything to represent, like, like a logo at least. Right. Yeah, so, so that's just, you know, I want to touch on that real quick. I like that. I like yeah. that. Lee Claire, yeah. yeah. There we go. There we go. Never know when we need to do that. Yeah. He win, He gets 20 points for that one. <laughs> uh, Lee Clay Bang, on your closing remarks, where are you seeing the music industry go? But basically, talk about whatever you want right here. <laughs> but in as much as, you know, for all those emerging artists out there who are wondering, how, how do I you know, get to where you're at, and yet you still have such a mountain to climb. Well, I think it's free game right now. I think everybody is starting in the same plateau. I mean, social media is... It's pretty crazy, you know, anybody can start a Facebook page, anybody can design a website. So the, the tools are there. It's just really, you still gotta have hard work. You still gotta have that dedication. You gotta be willing to continue to put those, those hours in, believe in yourself. But the number one thing is really, really believing in your product and be okay with what you define yourself as success. So like, right. for instance, you can be a, a rock band or whatever, and tour the world, nobody will never hear about you in LA. And you gotta be okay with that, but you're touring the world and you're making money, you're supporting your family. So you gotta figure out what level of success you want. Do you wanna be, mm -hmm. does your name, you want your name to be big in LA? Or do you want your name to be low and make a lot of money? Else, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, but those things yeah. are serious. Like, do you Absolutely. wanna have a bigger name than your actual talent is? So it's just a lot of different things. You gotta have a plan, you gotta have a goal. You gotta have a support system. I mean, if it's just your wife, hey, it's just your wife. That's your team. Right. If it's just you, then you roll it. Right. You know, do you, you want to be a quiet millionaire or a loud thousandaire? So. Oh, a quiet millionaire. <laughs> yeah. Those are dudes who just wear jeans and regular T-shirts. Yeah. You don't even know they got money. Right. And they get out their no car. No one even knows. No one e <laughs> uh, Brandy, what, what is your take on all this? Just jump in. Yes, one thing I stand on is the scripture, is I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. And I can, I can, I can. So if I can give anything, never doubt yourself. I would never thought that we would be um, CEOs of our own company, our own record label company, Fresh Nation. Like, I never thought that, you know? It's hard, and we learn a lot of mistakes as we go along, especially dealing with contracts, and uh, <laughs> it's a tough thing. But if I never said I couldn't do it, then I wouldn't be doing it now. So definitely we're looking to sign more artists and we're doing a, building a whole new, you know, a new way of doing things. And that's okay. just doing it, you know, in a positive light and not negative, you know. So definitely um, you can do it and never doubt yourself. A lot of music that I see out, I, I don't even call it music. I go back to the old school stuff, like the 60s and the 70s, because yeah. that to me is real music. It's not hiding behind a mix or something. No, it's the people actually playing like the instruments. So I definitely hope that the music does push more towards that. So. Do you ever have to like try to use legal zoom or when, what? What is your when you when people see here contracts? When our viewers out there are thinking yeah. contracts, so like, what does that mean? Like, where do you invent a contract? Definitely research. Um, we we had a great um, person who was working with us who taught me a lot about contracts, what to put in it, what should be in it, how to um, make sure your artists are taken care of when you're writing the contract that they have the best interest at heart. So definitely. Um, uh, research and dealing with other people in the industry, what kind of contracts they write, working with lawyers, um, artists, entertainment lawyers as well, and just how to develop a contract, how to write it up, and then what should be in there, what right. shouldn't be in there. Okay. So we can protect the, the industry. So, protect much, the so much to think about. And so right? much, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you can do it. You can do it. <laughs>
<laughs> it can be done. It can be done. Young Nova, jump in here. What are your closing remarks, you know, just your ideas of music right now? Well, um, definitely my idea of music right now is um, it's going digital. It's definitely going digital. Everything physical is fading out um, from cars to um, computers. They're basically phasing out the, um, the CD era. So it's definitely going digital, making everything faster, making everything straight quick to you. So the sound is going to be trending. Whatever's, whatever's popular, that's going to be right. what everybody follows. But the artists that create they own, their own lane and make music that actually means something, that's going to, it's going to come back around to that too. Like you see artists like uh, J. Cole, Wale, Drake, that's making a, um, a sound other than what's just trending. They're making their own sound and people are actually buying into their records more than right. what's um, trending right now. But I definitely see the game right now just going digital. Like in the um, near future, it's not probably not even going to be CD players in the car. So USBs, um, aux cords. So you, know, you make a good point. I don't, want you, I don't want you to get too far away from that. I want you to answer this. Um, because MP3s, everyone knows you lose a substantial amount of the quality of that song going away from records, CDs. What do you feel is really the worst thing that's happening? I mean, it's going. you're right, it's going digital, but do you, what do you feel as far as an artist standpoint, like, oh, I wish it wasn't going so digital because people don't really hear the song I'm producing. What, what is your take on that? Um... Yeah, the quality definitely drops when you go through um, all these different platforms to put it out. I would, I would, um, I'm enjoying the CD right now. Right now, I'm enjoying the CD because that's how I distribute my record. And then um, I can get it in bulk. I can get what I need in bulk and distribute it how I want to. And um, getting it through different platforms, it just makes it a different learning process. Okay. It's, it's not necessarily all the way bad, but it just makes it another learning process of how you figure out how you're gonna distribute um, your music, who you gotta talk to, where you gotta go through to get the um, material and products you need to put, right. your pro um, to put your um, product together. But it's definitely, like I said, going digital, so, yeah. Yeah, it would be a sad day if you couldn't go around and sell CDs. Like, how are you going to walk around and handing out people flash drives? Yeah, I don't know. most definitely. Yeah. I mean, they're not that cheap yet. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, Brian, you, I mean, like everyone here, you have a unique perspective on this because you do just manage. So mm -hmm. what's your closing remarks as far as just the music industry, whatever really that you're feeling needs to be discussed? I tend to have a different uh, take on it than most people. Most people feel like record, la you know, major record labels are going to go away and they're the dinosaurs and things like that. Um, I actually um, disagree. I, they'll still always be here because you will always need the business of music and you will always need a, a tremendous bankroll. If you want to be Rihanna, uh, Beyonce, things of that nature, you know, Katy Perry's, they will always need the financing. What you're going to see more, though, is you're going to see a lot more smaller, agile record companies. So not labels, but record companies. Things like Rock Nation, things like that, where they're going to do some management, publishing, um, you know, uh, producing, consulting. And so what you do is you see, you know, these little tribes of, of record companies that are a lot more agile. They're, they're they can handle several different aspects of the business without being com without having that tremendous overhead. And they'll still go to a Sony, and they'll still go to a, a Universal and, and a Warner Brothers for the financing and for the platform. Because think about it, you know, Live Nation is going to work with you know Universal. You know, um, um, iHeart Media is going to work with you know Interscope. So you're still going to need those those channels to get you know your your product if you want to be that big. Now, if you just want to be right. small and independent, oh, then you can do that you know with you all know day long. all day long. But if you still want to be like a major star. You, you need that money, you need those, those, those platforms. But the, the thing is, it's not to go get signed by Sony or, or directly, it's like, no, linking up with a smaller, agile rec recording company, or whether it's your own or one that you believe in, right. that sees your vision. They then will then go in to said big you know, corporation and be like, no, this is what we're doing. With our track record, let us do it this way. We're going to make you guys money. The majors, they just need to make money because they're all sold to bigger corporations and they're just, they're just you know, uh, uh, on a balance sheet. They just got to make money. So right. they don't really care what is successful. They literally could care less what's successful. They just need to make the money. So you tell them, like, oh, if we do it this way, we're gonna, you know, we'll be profitable. Oh, you're profitable? Because we lose money on this all, the, all day long. So we will go with what you're talking about. So do you, where do you think the fresh taste on this is? I mean, so the big labels lived, well, just like media. There's like four main media companies in the mm -hmm. world. There's only going to be four main labels. So, you know, in your closing remarks, briefly, do you think that it's going to be good for the musician or bad for the musician? I think it's going to be tremendous for the uh, musician because... Now that if we can strip it down and you can get to these smaller agile companies, the, the, the actual artist is going to go into said record company 
and be a priority, and that record company is going to understand that particular vision right. of what makes you special. You know, like he said, you know, uh, going back to some of the artists he was mentioning, J. Cole, J. Cole, excuse me, J. Cole gets to do J. Cole because he signed a Rock Nation, and that particular team believes in his method of making music. Okay. So they support him tremendously. So then when he goes to Epic to distribute it, Epic can't say anything because it's like, oh, Rock Nation believes in it. So I, I believe it's going to be tremendous for the artists once we really finish that out. Well, we could talk about this all day long, guys. However, what did you think? Was that a great panel or what? Well, on behalf of Lee Clay Bang, DJ Lico, we got Brandy D, Brian Salas, Young Nova, guys. Thank you so much for joining us here at Club Parallel. What's up? I hope everybody's enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I'm your host, Jesse Mogul. Have a great day. Good night. <laughs>